1776 is a year that brings to the minds of Americans all sorts of patriotic feelings. Most Americans think of 1776 as a year of triumph, of celebration, of independence. The reality is much more complicated than that. Now, the year began well enough, but by the closing weeks, this is how Thomas Paine described the situation. These are the times that try men's souls. So what happened? How did the year that the United States declared her independence nearly become the year that the United States ceased to exist? That's what I want to dive into today. But first, a huge thank you to the sponsor of this video, Curiosity Stream. If you're anything like me and you are constantly looking for something new to learn about, this is the streaming service for you. Curiosity Stream is a subscription-based service offering award-winning documentaries and series that you won't find anywhere else. Whether you prefer to watch on your television, your computer, or your mobile device, you'll have access to content covering science, nature, technology, art, music, and, of course, history. Curiosity Stream really does have something for everyone. For myself, I have been learning a ton from their four-part series on the history of the real Wild West, which goes all the way back to the Native Americans who first inhabited the land through Manifest Destiny, the Mexican-American War, the Gold Rush, the Oregon Trail, and into post-Civil War era with men like Jesse James. They even cover how American film culture developed with Westerns starring men like John Wayne. With plans starting at under $5 a month, you can gain access to thousands of hours of high quality documentaries and series with new content being added every week. With both monthly and annual plans available, you can choose the plan that works best for you and your budget. If you visit our custom link below at curiositystream.com slash vlogging or scan this QR code, you can gain unlimited access to Curiosity Stream's entire library and save 25% off using the promo code vlogging. Now, when the year opens, the revolution is not quite nine months old. The Continental Army is laying siege to the British forces at Boston. In January, George Washington dispatched General Charles Lee to the city of New York to survey and plan for the city's defense. Washington understood the importance of the Hudson River to Lake Champlain Corridor to the American cause. If you're familiar with the times I've talked about the American Civil War, think of the Mississippi River. Control of that river was vital to the Union war effort as it would effectively divide the Confederacy in two. And in the American Revolution, the same is true for the Hudson River. British possession of New York City would threaten that vital connection between New England and the rest of her sister colonies. And remember at this point, the revolution is primarily contained to the Northeast in the New England colonies. Now there've been some sporadic skirmishes in the other states, but Washington correctly understood that the British wanted to contain that problem in the North and isolate those colonies, if at all possible. Now that said, Washington also understood that if and when the city of Boston fell to the Americans, the British would probably shift their focus to the Hudson River, specifically to New York City. So he sent Charles Lee, who was one of the most experienced officers that he had, to prepare the defenses. In a letter to Lee, Washington wrote the following orders. Sir, having undoubted intelligence of the fitting out of a fleet at Boston and of the embarkation of troops from thence, which from the season of the year and other circumstances must be destined for a Southern expedition, and having such information as I can rely on that the inhabitants or great part of them on Long Island in the colony of New York are not only inimical to the rights and liberties of America, but by their conduct and public professions have discovered a disposition to aid and assist in the reduction of that colony to ministerial tyranny and 
as it is a matter of the utmost importance to prevent the enemy from taking possession of the city of New York and the North River, as they will thereby command the country and the communication with Canada, it is of too much consequence to hazard such a post at so alarming a crisis. He goes on to say, You will therefore, with such volunteers as are willing to join you, and can be expeditiously raised, repair to the city of New York, and calling upon the commanding officers of the forces of New Jersey for such assistance as he can afford and you shall require, you are to put that city in the best posture of defense, which the season and circumstances will admit of, disarming all such persons upon Long Island and elsewhere, and if necessary, otherwise securing them whose conduct and declarations have rendered them justly suspected of designs unfriendly to the views of Congress. So basically what Washington is doing is he's giving Lee orders not only to build up the defenses of the city of New York, but also to put it under martial law and round up anyone who might be loyal to the crown and therefore a threat from within. Now the British evacuated Boston in mid-March and by mid-April, after Lee had worked with Washington to devise a multi-layered plan in which troops would be stationed and ready to fight in different parts of the city, Continental soldiers began to leave New England and head for New York. Now, by this time, command of British forces in North America had been given to 46-year-old General Sir William Howe. Howe was one of three brothers with a distinguished military career, including his older brother, Admiral Richard Howe, who would be in command of the fleet transporting General Howe's troops to New York. They had significant royal ties as well, as their mother was the half-sister of King George I, making them cousins of the current King George III. General Howe had served in the Seven Years' War and was still serving as a member of parliament for Nottingham when he arrived in North America just after the war began. It was General Howe who commanded the troops that won a costly British victory at the Battle of Bunker Hill in June of 1775. He was chosen to replace Thomas Gage in command of all British forces that September. Now, on June 28th of 1776, on the very day that Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, and their committee presented the draft of the Declaration of Independence to the Continental Congress, General Washington noted, quote, we have certain advice, end quote, about the British troops heading in the direction of New York City. His men had counted 130 ships they believed had left Halifax, Nova Scotia, carrying General Howe and thousands of British regulars. Because of the dire situation, Washington sent a dispatch requesting that Massachusetts not lose a moment of time in sending forward the militia of her province. Lee's plan for the defense of the city of New York had begun with engineers who surveyed and mapped out sites best suitable for fortifications, all while Lee struggled to get around on swollen feet from a recurring case of gout. With Washington's approval, Lee's plans had focused on keeping the British off of Brooklyn Heights on Long Island and out of access to the East River. Lee concluded that if the British could be limited to an attack on Manhattan from the south or from the west, then American forces could defend every hill and inflict heavy casualties. Lee planned for fighting street by street using barricades and redoubts. He hoped to turn New York into what he called an advantageous field of battle and turn the British invasion of that place into a series of Bunker Hill style assaults that would destroy their army a little at a time. Now, despite all of these preparations, General Washington offered a blunt assessment of the situation in a letter to his brother John, where he wrote, we expect a very bloody summer at New York. And I'm sorry to say that we are not either in men or arms prepared for it. Now for his part, Washington had to defend the fortifications in and around New York with around 20,000 men. Almost all were infantry, few cannon, no cavalry, and not a single naval warship. 
These were mainly militia and untrained recruits with a motley collection of weapons and inexperienced officers to lead them. In essence, New York was defended by an army of poorly equipped, poorly led amateurs. Now, what were they facing? A force that by mid-August would number over 30,000 well-trained, well-equipped British and Hessian soldiers, supported by 10 ships of the line, 20 frigates, hundreds of smaller vessels, and around 10,000 sailors. On July 2nd, the very day the Continental Congress voted on independence in Philadelphia, the first ships of the Armada carrying Howe's army sailed unopposed into New York Harbor. Through July and into August, their numbers grew. The greatest British expeditionary force in history to that point transformed Staten Island into the second largest city in North America. To an American soldier on duty at the Battery of Manhattan, the harbor appeared so crammed with ships that he thought all London was afloat. It was shock and awe. The opening move came on August 22nd, 1776. Covered by the guns of five men of war, 15,000 British and Hessian soldiers made an amphibious landing at Gravesend Bay on the southwestern shore of Long Island. The plan, which was conceived by General Henry Clinton, was to split the army into three divisions. Two divisions would make feints directly against the Americans entrenched on wooded hills in heights beyond. The largest division, 10,000 men, would make a night march through an unguarded pass on the left of the American line and turn their flank by surprise. It was not the last time Washington's army would be fooled by a similar plan. When fighting began on August 27th, the plan worked to perfection. The British smashed through American positions, sending the defenders fleeing for their lives. Washington watched helplessly from Brooklyn Heights as his line crumbled. It would have been a complete disaster, but two things saved his army. The first was a heroic stand by men from Maryland. The first Maryland regiment was under the command of Colonel William Smallwood. They anchored the right of Lord Sterling's line against British General Grant's diversionary attack. Lord Sterling ordered all of his troops except for a small contingent of the 1st Maryland under command of Major Mordecai Gist to fall back across the creek. The men who stayed behind became known in history as the Maryland 400. Sterling and Gist led these men in a rear guard action against more than 2,000 of the best British and Hessian soldiers supported by two cannon. They made several frontal assaults before the survivors attempted to fall back. Some of the men who tried to cross the marsh were bogged down in the mud under musket fire and others who weren't able to swim were captured. Lord Sterling himself was surrounded and as he was unwilling to surrender to the British, he broke through the British line to von Heister's Hessians and surrendered to them. More than 100 men were captured and over 250 were killed. Fewer than a dozen of the Marylanders made it back to the American lines. General Washington, watching this fight from a redoubt on nearby Cobble Hill, exclaimed, Good God, what brave fellows I must this day lose. Now, the other thing that saved Washington's army was the weather. Specifically, a well-timed fog and a favorable wind over the night of August 29th that covered an evacuation by boat to the island of Manhattan. Howe failed to pursue Washington, and for more than two weeks, the armies remained separated by the East River. Now, during this lull in the fighting, there was an attempt at peace. All the way back in July, when the British fleet first arrived at New York, Admiral Howe had made several attempts to open communications with General Washington. The first two attempts to deliver letters to Washington were turned away because Howe had refused to recognize Washington's title. Washington, however, eventually agreed to meet in person with one of Howe's adjutants, a man named Colonel James Patterson. That meeting had taken place on July 20th, and Washington learned that Howe's diplomatic powers were essentially limited to the granting of pardons. 
Washington responded that the Americans had not done anything that required pardoning. Howe then turned his attention to Ben Franklin, a man he had known back in London in the previous few years. Now he expected he would get a favorable reply from Franklin, but that was not what happened. After Franklin read Howe's letter in Congress on July 30th, he wrote back to the Admiral saying, directing pardons to be offered to the colonies who are the very parties injured can have no other effect than that of increasing our resentments. It is impossible we should think of submission to a government that has with the most wanton barbarity and cruelty burned our defenseless town, excited the savages to massacre our peaceful farmers and our slaves to murder their masters, and is even now bringing foreign mercenaries to deluge our settlements with blood. After taking Long Island, the Howes had once again attempted negotiations. During the battle, they had captured several high-ranking Continental Army officers, including Major General John Sullivan. They managed to convince Sullivan that a conference with members of the Continental Congress might be beneficial, and so they released him on parole to deliver a message to the Congress in Philadelphia. It proposed an informal meeting to discuss ending the armed conflict between Britain and its rebellious colonies. After Sullivan's speech to Congress, John Adams cynically referred to Sullivan as a decoy duck and accused the British of sending Sullivan to, quote, seduce us into a renunciation of our independence, end quote. Now, eventually, Congress did agree to send three of its members, Adams, Benjamin Franklin, and Edward Rutledge, to a conference with Lord Howe. They were instructed to ask a few questions and take Howe's answers but had no further authority than that. When Admiral Howe learned of the committee's limited authority, he actually considered calling the meeting off, but after a discussion with his brother, he decided to proceed. None of the commissioners believed the conference would amount to anything. Now, I could go into detail about the meeting, but one British commentator put it best when he said it this way, quote, they met, they talked, they parted and now nothing remains but to fight it out." End quote. Lord Howe reported the failure of the conference to his brother, and both made preparations to continue the campaign for New York City. Now, going back to the military situation, by the end of August, Washington had decided that it was best to abandon Long Island and focus his defenses on the island of Manhattan. Now remember the original plan, hold Long Island, defend Manhattan on the west and south, and fight street to street. Well, now they've lost Long Island, and they're not well prepared for an attack on Manhattan that will now come from the east. Washington now began to debate what he was going to do next. He considered a number of different options. He could defend the city, despite having lost Long Island, which was key to his defensive plan. He could evacuate the city and leave it to the British, or he could destroy the city so it didn't fall into enemy hands, then fall back to defensive positions further north. He sent a letter to Continental Congress President John Hancock in Philadelphia seeking further instructions. Now on September 5th, one of his most trusted subordinates, General Nathaniel Green, returned to duty from illness, and he urged General Washington to abandon the city. Without Long Island, he argued, the defenses of Manhattan could not be held. He recommended that the city be burned after being evacuated. Now that same day, Washington also received a letter from John Hancock urging him not to destroy the city, but giving him permission to abandon it if necessary. Washington convened war councils on September 7th and again on the 12th. After the second one, the decision was made to pull the main body of the army back to Harlem Heights, but to leave between four and 5,000 men under General Putnam to defend the city. On the 15th of September, the British began to cross the East River. Opposing their landing were 500 Connecticut militia, most of whom didn't even have muskets. They were armed with pikes and they hadn't eaten or slept for more than a day. 
These barely armed farmers were facing a first wave landing of 4,000 British and Hessian professional soldiers on 80 flatboats. At around 11 a.m., five British war warships unleashed broadsides into the American defensive works. A private secretary to Lord Howe wrote about this and said, quote, so terrible and so incessant a roar of guns few even in the army and navy had ever heard before, end quote. By the time the first flatboats reached the shore, the militia were already in retreat. About a mile inland from Kipps Bay, Washington rode his horse among the fleeing men, trying to turn them around and impose some sense of order on them as he cursed violently. By some accounts, he lost his temper, brandished a cocked pistol and drew his sword, threatening to run men through. As he shouted, take the walls, take the cornfield. When no one obeyed his orders, he threw his hat on the ground and exclaimed in disgust, are these the men with which I am to defend America? The Hessians shot or bayoneted a number of American troops who attempted to surrender. One British officer even wrote, quote, I saw a Hessian sever a rebel's head from his body and clap it on a pole in the entrenchment, end quote. 2,000 Continental Army troops under the command of Generals Samuel Parsons and John Fellows arrived from the north, but at the sight of the chaotic militia in retreat, they also turned and fled. Washington, still in a rage, rode within 100 yards of the enemy, with one observer noting, quote, stupefied, immobilized by his seething fury, he was heedless. One of his men grabbed the reins of his horse and hurried Washington to a safer place. By the end of the day, Howe had taken the city and landed around 15,000 troops on the island of Manhattan. They pushed north until they encountered stiff American resistance. It was a victory for the British, but not a complete one. They missed a golden opportunity to cut off and capture or kill nearly a third of Washington's army. Now, for the sake of time, I want to summarize the next few weeks because I want to wrap up this story by talking about the end of the year and how Washington was able to pull the Continental Army back from the brink of annihilation. The British decided against a frontal assault on Washington's position at Harlem and chose once again to try and outflank him. On October 8th, British naval vessels sailed up the Hudson River in the direction of Westchester County. The Americans resisted, and afterward, both sides withdrew all of their respective forces that remained in Manhattan to join the fight in Westchester. Washington next decided to march north to White Plains, where General Howe arrived on October 22nd with approximately 14,000 men, of whom 8,000 were Hessians. On the 28th of October, at the Battle of White Plains, Washington's lines were once again outflanked, and once again, the British failed to press their advantage and destroy the Continental Army. After the loss at White Plains, the attention once again turned to the island of Manhattan. Washington wanted to abandon the forts on the Hudson and withdraw, but his subordinates convinced him to keep them in place. Now, this decision proved fatal to a significant portion of Washington's army when on November 16th, British and Hessian forces assaulted the Fort Washington defenses and forced the surrender of its garrison, around 3,000 men. After this defeat, Fort Lee fell to General Cornwallis on November the 20th. However, Cornwallis made another crucial British error when he prohibited the Hessians from destroying the American forces led by Washington who were crossing the Hackensack River. That mistake allowed the Americans to escape to New Jersey unharmed and march until reaching Trenton on December 2nd. At Trenton, they proceeded to evacuate into Pennsylvania by crossing the Delaware River. Now at this point, Washington has just a few thousand men left of his army, and many of them are about to reach the end of their enlistment period. The only thing keeping what's left of his army from annihilation is the Delaware River and the lack of aggression by General Howe. So on December 23rd, Thomas Paine, who's with Washington's army 
published his first edition of the American Crisis. This is what he wrote. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands by it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. He then goes on to describe the battle for New York, the retreat across New Jersey, and the threat that the army now faces. But he also insists that independence can and will still be won. His words begin to circulate around the campfires of the army and bring a much needed resolve to the few men who remain. Now the British, for their part, are so confident that they're on the verge of victory that Howe expects Washington to ask for terms any day. He spreads his forces out in small garrisons across New Jersey, believing his enemy already defeated. And it's in these moments, when all hope is lost, that George Washington exhibits the kind of leadership that was necessary to will the Patriot cause to victory. He had a spy in the town of Trenton named John Honeyman. And Honeyman was not only relaying intelligence about the Hessian forces there back to Washington, he was also working on convincing the Hessian commander, a man named Colonel Rawl, that the Americans were so broken that they posed no threat to his isolated outpost. Washington, with a shattered army, a fraction of the size it had been a few months earlier, near the end of their enlistments and ready to go home, decides to go on the attack. Now, had this gone badly, history would look back on Trenton as the last desperate charge of a defeated and failed rebellion. Instead, it is seen as the moment when the dying embers of independence were rekindled. Washington's plan called for a multi-pronged movement by the remnants of his army. General John Cadwallader would launch a diversionary attack against the British garrison at Bordentown, New Jersey, in order to block off reinforcements from the south. General James Ewing would take 700 militia across the river at Trenton Ferry, seize the bridge over Assunpink Creek, and prevent enemy troops from escaping Trenton. The main assault, 2,400 men, would cross the river nine miles north of Trenton and split into two groups, one under General Greene and the other under General Sullivan, in order to launch a pre-dawn attack. Sullivan would attack the town from the south, Greene from the north. Now before Washington and his troops left for their attack on Trenton, he was visited by Dr. Benjamin Rush, who had arrived to cheer up the general. While he was there, Rush saw a note that Washington had scribbled out with the words, victory or death. Those words would be the password for the attack on Trenton. Each soldier would carry 60 rounds of ammunition and three days of rations. When the army arrived at the shores of the Delaware, they were already behind schedule. And then it began to rain, and the rain turned to sleet and then to snow. The men went across in Durham boats while the horses and artillery went across on ferries. The 14th Continental Regiment under Colonel John Glover manned the boats. During the crossing, several men fell overboard, but no one died during the crossing itself, and all of the artillery made it over in good condition. The crossing was supposed to be completed by midnight in order to facilitate a pre-dawn attack, but it was 3 a.m. before the final men were ashore in New Jersey. They began the march toward Trenton at four. As they marched, Washington rode up and down the line, encouraging his men as best he could. At one point, General Sullivan sent a courier back to tell Washington that the weather was getting his men's gunpowder soaked. But Washington replied, quote, tell General Sullivan to use the bayonet. I am resolved to take Trenton, end quote. In Trenton was a brigade of Hessians under the command of Colonel Johann Rall, a regiment of grenadiers, two regiments of fusiliers, six pieces of artillery, 
a detachment of Jaegers, and around 20 members of the British 16th Light Dragoons, about 1,400 men in all. Colonel Rawl had described Trenton as indefensible and had made very little effort to fortify his position there. It was around 8 a.m. before the assault on the town finally began, several hours past time. Washington rode in front of his men, leading the attack from the north. The Hessians were caught by surprise, but they managed to quickly organize a defense. They got artillery into position and fired off several rounds at the advancing Continentals. Contrary to popular belief, there's little evidence to suggest that the Hessians were drunk or even hung over when the battle began. Surprised and maybe a little stunned, yes but not unable to fight because they were recovering from a long night of drinking and partying. Colonel Rawl eventually organized a fairly decent counterattack. He yelled, forward, advance, advance, and the Hessians began to move with their brigade's band playing fifes, bugles, and drums to help build their fighting spirit. Washington, who was still on the high ground north of town, saw the Hessians approaching the American flank. He moved troops to defend against Rawls' attack. Two Hessian regiments began marching toward King Street, but they were caught in a U.S. crossfire that came at them from three directions. By this point, some Americans had taken up defensive position inside of the houses in town. Even civilians joined in the fight against the Hessian soldiers. Eventually, the Hessian attack stalled. Their formation broke and they began to scatter. It was around this time that Colonel Rawl was mortally wounded. Most of the Hessians retreated into an orchard with Americans in close pursuit. They were quickly surrounded and offered the opportunity to surrender, which they accepted. Now in the fighting, the Hessians lost 22 killed, 83 wounded, and nearly a thousand captured or missing. All four Hessian colonels in the battle were killed or mortally wounded. On the American side, there were two deaths from exposure, but none from the battle itself. They did suffer five wounded, including a nearly fatal shoulder wound to Lieutenant and future President James Monroe. Now, perhaps more important than the captured Hessians, the Americans also captured their entire store of provisions, flour, dried and salted meats, ale and other liquors, as well as shoes, boots, clothing and bedding, things that were badly needed, as well as a thousand muskets and a great deal of ammunition. Trenton was a small battle, but the impact it had on the war effort cannot be understated. It provided supplies, a desperately needed morale boost, improved the rate of reenlistment dramatically and was followed up by further American victories at Assen Pink Creek and at Princeton. It softened the blow of what had been a disastrous few months for the Continental Army, and it gave them the hope to carry on.